I was a negotiator for some years, and I would be able to define what would, would have been a negotiated offer. So I don't share your scepticism that it wouldn't work in practice, even though I understand why you wouldn't actually want well, to. It would work for the business, it. wouldn't it? That's the idea. Well, well, it could also work for your, for your members. The, we obviously heard um, when we had the session with um, your deputy uh, and Mr Shoveler earlier that that 8% pay offer had just been made. Um, do you not think it would have been reasonable at least to put it to your members and just determine whether they were willing to accept that or if, as you say, they wouldn't, then you've got your proof and you've got your negotiating arm? Well, we did put it to our members through their elected reps. I mean, that's what you do in the well, chamber. No, I mean Isn't that what members. you do in this chamber every day? Are you, are you going to put the, uh, yeah, we the Chancellor's budget to a referendum? Well, no, we, no we, you're going to put it to elected reps? Well, no, we, we, no, we and don't. And make the decision? No, not at all. We all actually have our vote. That's the whole point. We, we don't we Yeah, don't and give so, it to so do our reps when we have a mass hmm. meeting. No, but what about all of, your, all of your members? Seeing as well, what we about all, all your members? constituents? Will they vote on the budget? The next or will next you election. let their elected well, representatives the next vote election. Well, obviously, if we work on every basis like that, then we'll be in Switzerland. But, well, exactly. uh, where the railways may work. We actually, would have so. exactly the same situation in the union. We've got multiple companies. We deal with 400 companies uh, in the course of a year. Unite must deal with four or 5,000, for all I know. We'd be running around running referendums well, so on, a, on a non-stop basis. Following your logic, why do you bother putting anything to the members at all, then? If, because if we, get to a, we get to a final position that may be at the point of either agreement or impasse, and we go to them for their endorsement. I mean, you didn't put every version of the European uh, Treaty to, to the, well, we, the country. We, 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 we long tried debate it, we, about that. We tried it once, tried yeah. to say, say to that. Exactly. Um, Does the RMT accept that in order to secure everybody's jobs within the railways, something does need to fundamentally change in terms of making the railways attractive to people to buy tickets again, and having uncertainty over whether the train will be running in the first place is equally driving people away from the railways and back into their cars or coaches or whatever it may be. I think you're absolutely right. The railway does need fundamental change, but it's not the one that the railway companies are seeking. We need a railway that runs in the interest of the people and the interest of the economy and the environment, not in the interest of first group and others who are subject to private equity takeovers because they're so attractive. The changes they wish to make to strip out wages and conditions are so that they can make increased profits going forward, and they're doing that at the behest of the Secretary of State and the previous incumbent in that job on an ideological basis. So what we need is lower fares. We need uh, an incentivisation for people to get out of their cars and onto the railway. They won't do that with the current fare structure and the current industry structure, and they won't do that with the industry tr uh, structure that's proposed under the uh, Shap's white paper for Great British Rail, because you'll keep the corrupt system of railway privatisation where there is no risk, where these people have got a, a one-way ticket to profit, as you've just heard, where even if they score zero on customer satisfaction uh, and are unable to run the trains at all when there's no industrial action because they've declared war on the staff and on the passenger, they will make profit no matter what happens because that's the structure that's been put in place. What so we need fundamental the, change, yes. What do we don't need the, to attack the staff. What do you believe was the average profit margin for a railway operator pre-pandemic? It's quite low, but there's no risk. There's no risk to them at the moment. Do you accept the 2% figure? It's probably 2%, but if there's billions of pounds in, in circulation, that is quite a comfortable living. If I was getting 2% of all railway income, I'd be doing quite well. And so... Normally, businesses have to put capital at risk, don't they? Yeah. That's why they justify their profit. Well, this is a cartel of people that are working with the government to produce surpluses at no risk to themselves. Yeah. And no matter what their reputation is in this, in this industry, the government will keep paying them. That is ridiculous, and I might put it, a corrupt system, because there's no incentive for them to make any change. The talks have taken £3.5 billion pounds worth of profit out of the railway since privatisation. They haven't done anything for us because so they've got no risk. It, 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 if and when I they've may, had I risk, want to get they've handed back point. the keys. Mr Lynch, I, I would like to get into this, this, this profit point because I think these figures are disputed. I've seen things from, uh, from your union that talks about five, six hundred million pound profits and yeah. yet there is equally data out there that suggests uh, since, since privatisation, as you've raised it, that passenger numbers in fact doubled on the railways uh, and have reduced roughly a two billion annual operating loss. And some of your figures don't seem to take into account the rolling stock costs and the supply chain 
They do, costs. and the rolling stock companies and are making vast profits. Well, uh, Last year, when there were virtually no passengers, we, we, they we, made £150 million pounds worth of profit. We will disagree on whether profit is a good or a bad thing, I'm Profit's sure. OK, however, 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 the return of risk. I'm trying, to, uh, I'm trying to understand, for the evidence base of this select committee, <coughs> where the real profit is, because there is a lot of analysis out there that suggests the real op operating profits of the railways is likely to be post-pandemic somewhere between 100 and 150 million pounds. Now, w I'm sure we'll agree that that no is a risk. lot of money, but that translates to about a 2% pay rise for one year, not the sort of numbers that we're talking about. So, Well, how does it translate to a pay rise? They could make the pay rises without uh, getting rid of their profits. And you've got to ask the question, why, would they be, why are they in this business at all to make profit? We don't need... Uh, private rail operating companies that we've got with LNER and several other the operators who couldn't cope. We don't need the incentive of private I just companies. Understand. You just said that they could make pay rises without impacting their profits. So where no, else is the money going to come it, from? It, it doesn't necessarily wipe out all of their profit. But I would be very happy if we had no private sector rail operators and we could pay the staff a proper wage. In terms of the Secretary of State, well, the previous one just kept abusing me and everybody else and calling me a Baron and all this business and a militant. Uh, and I don't think the people that support us, the people who are out on our picket lines, are a bunch of militants. I think there are men and women who want a square deal off their employer. What it needs is a new atmosphere. They, they've cut the funding. They've cut it on London Transport as well, which is why we've got difficulties there. It's four, four billion in total. So we could settle these with a bit more funding. Uh, people don't want to hear that. But if, if you're cutting money, uh, you have to put up with the consequences. And we're hearing that all over the economy. But creating a different atmosphere is helpful. So I know that leading people, Sir Peter Hendy, um, the chief execs and various others have been to see the Secretary of State, which is good. I hope they get a new mandate. I think it's strange that Steve Montgomery isn't here today uh, answering questions as to what his role is in, as the chair of the RG, RDG and the person who's running Avanti directly. Why they've sent somebody who claims to know nothing about the disputes is beyond me because they could have got direct knowledge on that. So, I mean, to, it, be, to, to be fair, um, that would be my fault because we didn't. I didn't actually invite him in, in that right. sense. So um, we wanted to hear about Avanti's operations and network rails yeah, negotiations. So he's I'll running the operations one, of, network, of Avanti at the moment. So it, it's helpful that there's a different mindset, I suppose, and a different approach. And it's helpful that she's met us, but we have to see something at the negotiating table that changes the formula, the paradigm, whatever the posh word is. Uh, that we're going to take forward. Uh, but at the moment, we haven't seen it. But if I can perhaps sum up, would you, on behalf of your members, ever accept driverless trains? And without you immediately saying no, say, for instance, a 50-year-old driver was offered severance pay for driverless trains to take place, say, of, I don't know, half a million. I'm not going into negotiations with you at this point. But would you put that to your drivers, or would you just dismiss that out of hand? Well, we don't think it's safe to have driverless trains on the mainline railway. So you'd have to spend more money than Kwasi Kwarteng has printed last week to bring in driverless trains in this country. The, the ability to detect cattle and sheep and people crossing, we can't even work out level crossings in this country. Network Rail have not got the infrastructure. We haven't got automatic signalling uh, only on one route to, to McCuncliffe, I think, at the moment. So you are decades and decades away from that becoming a question. And if you want to go up to the Highlands of Scotland and have a driverless train, you'll have a train that is stopped forever because there's no infrastructure and this government is not going to give it any investment, even towards getting a more efficient railway system. The only real new signalling projects you're getting are on things like HS1 and there are little piecemeal bits around the system. So You admit it works on DLR? Well, there, there's a, they are attended trains and our members on DLR drive those trains as soon as they've lost coherence with the signalling system. So there is always a person on those trains. DLR has got exactly the same crewing requirement as a London Underground train. There's a person that is capable of driving that train on it and is responsible for the dispatch. So it's not true that there's a driverless train. The person on it is a qualified driver. Okay. Chairman, I'll go back to you because I know there's other things we're getting with Thank you. What will you accept in terms of change on the railway, either through greater automation or, um, or technology coming in to ensure that, that costs can be reduced on other things other than what we pay the human beings that work on the railways in order to secure job security? Well, we've accepted change constantly in my lifetime on the railway. We've had new technology constantly, whether that's retail of, of tickets, 
whether it's the technology on rolling stock or whether it's the technology on repairing the track. And we are constantly in dialogue with Network Rail about that. What we won't accept is a, a decline in safety standards where they're going to uh, cut 50% of the maintenance standard tasks, where they want to make our people work permanent nights, which we think endangers them, and they want to make our people have a work-life balance that is entirely unacceptable. So what we will accept is a negotiated change uh, uh, and an evolution of the railway. We won't accept a massive imposition where they will require us to, to work overtime uh, constantly because there aren't enough people there anymore, and where they will sign, for instance, they've just signed a new deal with the private sector infrastructure companies for £13 billion while they're looking to make their own people redundant. So we, what we will accept is a negotiated change to our agreements, not an imposition.